But uh, this morning we begin, and uh, before we talk about character, actually, I, I want to talk to you about doors, doors and, and the importance of doors. And, uh, you know, I, I want you to think about, about doors. Doors are, are important. And in, in the Bible, the Bible uses door, a door, as a metaphor for our life. And Jesus comes, he says, behold, I stand at the door and knock. That's, that's, that's your life. And, and you open the door. And, and so we use doors as a, as a metaphor. We're doing the open door class. And the open door class is a class that opens the door to being involved in our church. You, you get in the open door class, then you can, you can go on from there. You can become a, a member. You can't become a member until you've gone through the open door class. Uh, you go through the open door to become a part of uh, of ministries here. We, our worship team, everybody on our worship team has gone through the open door class. Everybody in our CE has gone through the open door class. We just, uh, you know, it's, it's a part of being, being a part of our church. So we use that metaphor as a door. When we talk about opportunities, the door, it, it, doors are important. Your happiness, success, mental health, reputation, and uh, relationships are all determined about how well your door swings. And so, so the most important thing about you is not so much in how your door looks because the looks are superficial. You, you can walk up to a nice door and open the door and find no floors or furnace, right? And so I have a number of, of, of doors here. I mean, uh, there's that door, and, and, but there's some awesome, some awesome, beautiful, nice doors that are, are made to ma match the decor. And there's a door where, where the top part is all glass. And I mean, that's a, that's a beautiful door, isn't it? Somebody put a lot of money into that. And this, this door here on my left is probably Christmas time. So how many people like to decorate their door at Christmas? Okay, we've got some hands. You, you, you hang a wreath on your door, a snowman. Uh, I, you, you know, people do all kinds of things. And doors come in all shapes and sizes. So you see, it doesn't matter really what the door looks like. Let's go to the next, next slide here. Here's some more doors. Again, we have a, a door. It's a Christmas door. No snow, so I'm thinking it's in a nice climate, but they still do the wreaths. It, when you live in a northern climate, it, it's really hard to think about Christmas without snow. Isn't that right? You know, because you, you want snow. You, you're dreaming of a white... How many are dreaming of a white Christmas? Nobody. Oh, there's a few of you. Well, shame on you. Just don't ask Jesus to, to make a snow Christmas. Uh, and, and then you have the beautiful decorated doors where you have, where, where you have things carved in them. And, and, and after the sermon in the, in the first service, people were telling me how they, how they love to go to different places. They love to take pictures of doors. How many like to take pictures of doors? There's a few. Yeah, okay. There's a few folks that'll take pi pictures of doors. And you go to some of these places in Europe or even Quebec City and around, you'll find very interesting doors. And then there's this, this door here on my right. That would, be a, that would be a modern door. You know, it's kind of got funky, a funky window and all of that. Here, here's the things that, that we put a lot of money and we put a lot of time into the door and how the door looks. All right? You, we, we put a lot of money into our life and, and, and how our life looks, whether it looks nice, because, because we, we know that people look at us and they, they may judge us by what our door looks like, what our life looks like. And so people, you know, they think, well, if I, if I, if I put a fresh coat of paint on the door, then everything's going to be better. Everything's going to work out better. But really, the door is ineffective. The most important thing about the door is how the hinges work. How the hinges work. See, because if, if the hinge is all rusty, and if it's rusted so that it won't move, you don't longer have a door, do you? You have a wall. You don't have a door. I had a, I had a rusty hinges on a, on a, on a, on a door that, that was underneath my porch, and I just didn't pay attention to it. I went one day, I couldn't, I couldn't open the door. And when I forced it, I broke the hinge right in where the two on the weakest part of the hinge because the hinge was no longer effective. The door no longer, no longer worked. Even the things that you desire in your life, if your door does not swing properly, if the hinge doesn't work, then the door doesn't swing properly. If it's creaky or if it's rusted, 
You're not going to realize those things. If your hinges are broken, the door will not open, and you will experience nothing but failure. You will experience frustration in every area of your life eventually. Eventually, it will come upon you. You may not see it now. You can fake it. You can fake it for years. And folks, there's a lot of people in our culture, they've been faking it. They've been faking it for years. There's a lot of people in churches that have been faking it for years. But eventually... At some time, you're going to realize that that door isn't going to open because the hinges no longer work. It is rusted. It is rusted shut. You might try to look good by decorating your door, by making it look richer or costly, or making it look inviting and welcome, but you will not experience the fullness of joy and life if the hinges are, are broken. It's amazing. I'm, I'm learning how small things, the, the hinge is such a small thing, but it holds such a great door. You don't need a big hinge to hold a great door. You just need a good one, and, and that door will swing. And the, you know, there's a, uh, I, I read this week in my devotions a, a verse in, in Zechariah. It says this, do not, dis, do not despise the day of small things. Be, do not, because it is those small things on which everything else hinges and works. And that is, that is the truth. The small things. You know what? If, 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 it's, it's what your life hinges on. It's what your life hinges on. This is how Aristotle perceived character and virtue. Aristotle taught that character are the hinges upon which the great door of human fulfillment and flourishing would swing. That's, that's what Her Aristotle taught. And Jesus went even farther than Aristotle. He went much, much, much deeper than Aristotle did. If you have a goal, a dream, a destination, a desire, an expectation of happiness or success, it's not a pretty well-painted Door, a life that's gussied up to look good that's going to get you there, but it's on what that life swings that'll make all of the difference in your life. And so Jesus teaches us the importance, the importance of character. He understood character as, as the, 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 the way of leading a happy life, but more than happy, rather a door to blessedness and participation in the kingdom of God. So Aristotle said, a good character, a good character is the thing that a good life is built on, a fulfillment and success. And Jesus says, oh no, it's much more important than that, Aristotle, you see, because if people are following me, it's a good character on which the blessings of God flow and swing in a person's life. And so if you want to enjoy the blessings of God, it comes through a good character and being like Jesus. If you, if you want to have failure and, and misery and heartbreak, well, you know what, just... Just don't, don't, don't follow Christ and, and don't build your life on a good character. Jesus did not teach that someday, in the sweet by and by, that the kingdom of God was going to come. Jesus said that blessedness comes through our character as we participate today in the kingdom of God. One of the things that, that has been a false idea that has been passed around in churches is that we enter into God's kingdom after we die and go to heaven. How many have heard that? Oh, you know, we just die and go to heaven, we enter into the kingdom of God. It's not true. It's not true. We die, and when we die as Christians, we go to heaven. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. So, okay? So that we, we know that. But the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven is not something that we receive later or in the sweet by and by. Jesus taught that the kingdom of God is immediate and present now, right now. And it's in that kingdom that we develop a character that releases God's blessings in our life. Matthew chapter 12, verse 29, Jesus said this, the kingdom of God has come upon you. See, those people were thinking, oh, it's back. You know what? It's going to come someday in the sweet by and by when I'm on the clouds and I'm in the sky. Anyway, we won't sing that song today because I don't know the rest of it, but it is a song. And, 
We, it's not that way. The song is telling us something that's not true. The kingdom of God is upon you, Jesus said. Luke chapter 17, verse 20 to 21. The coming of the kingdom of God is not something that can be observed, nor will people say, here it is, or there it is, because the kingdom of God is in your midst. Or some versions say the kingdom of God is in you. It's there. And so as we experience the kingdom, see, Jesus says, the people who have a kingdom character are the people who have a, a life that swings on the character of Christ and they experience God's blessings. Let's look at Matthew chapter 5, verses 3 to 11. We see the kingdom of God. We see the, the character, the virtues of these, the, the kingdom. They, they, they're called the Beatitudes or the, the attitudes that a person has, the virtues. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the, the, the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall be shown mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted because of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and talk falsely and say all kinds of evil against you because of me. And Jesus goes down and says, those are the things, those are the attitudes, those are the character. That is the character of the kingdom, and that is what releases the blessings of God in your life. So let's take a look at the character of Jesus' blessedness. People think that the goal of a good life swings on the hinges of happiness. It's all around you. You go on Facebook, you're getting, you're getting ads. I mean, you know, you, 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 you look for, you, you look for uh, something, uh, you, you look for a, a, a roofing contractor online, and all of a sudden, all these roofing contractors show up in your Facebook. How do they know that? Hey, you, you, you look for makeup, and all of a sudden you get all kinds of makeup advertisements. Because, and, and those advertisements are geared towards you to get a better life. I mean, they have an algorithm. It's got your name on it, and they just push everything at you. That They, they begin to build a profile about you so that they can tell you what you want to buy so that you will buy it, and it will give you a happier life. You drive down the street. You see signs that say, this will make my life happy. You turn on their TV. There's some lady there saying, this soap has changed my life. I'm so much happier now that I use this dish soap. Don't worry, Madge, it's palm olive. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's all around us. We're bombarded with that. We are bombarded with that message. And for the most part, we've bought it hook, line, hook, line, and sinker. Do you see any problem with the perspective that our, the golden life swings on and hinges on happiness? you see any problem with that? I, I think it's, it's a huge problem. I think it is. I want to suggest that pursuing happiness as your goal is like pushing a door open that has rusty and broken hinges. It, it just doesn't work. See, happiness is not a hinge at all. Happiness is a shiny object you attach to the door. People think, well, I'll be happy if I have a new car. My old car really smells bad. <laughs> well, your new car will smell new for a while. And then it'll smell like the old car again, because guess who's in it? <laughs> you're going to be eating your McDonald's in there and drinking your Tim Hortons and smoking cigarettes if you're a smoker, or your kids will be in the back with peanut butter sandwich, and pretty soon it'll be just like the old car. You'll park it over at Zares, and somebody will scrape it. You'll park it over somewhere else, and some, something, a some buggy will run into it, and all of a sudden it'll look like the old thing that you bought. And that's because happiness is, is not a hinge. It's just a trinket on the outside. It, it, gets, it, it gets weathered by the elements and by time, and pretty soon it looks old and tarnished, and, and it, doesn't, it, doesn't, it just doesn't work. It, it does not work. Happiness is unhinged from character. Happiness is like the equation, and this is, this is the equation that many, many people have bought into, that H, which, which stands for happiness equals N, N stands for number, and uh, equals N with F, the number of fun events. Therefore, the equation is 
is this. A happiness is equivalent to the number of fun events I can ex experience and accumulate in my, my lifetime. This is happiness unhinged from character. It doesn't satisfy. It's superficial. It's unfulfill unfulfilling. And it's no wonder uh, people are having, having a lot of difficulty in their lives, especially if they're in a climate where they're told, hey, don't go out, stay home, you'll get sick. And they get all, they, they can't handle it. They, they have a breakdown because, because I, I have to be happy and I have to have experiences because that's what life is all about. No, it isn't. Th this is an interesting t statistic. Martin Sligman notes that there is a tenfold increase in depression among baby boomers over any, any previous generation. T tenfold. We're not talking about a 10% increase. We're talking about tenfold. That is, that is huge. That is huge. If you had 100 baby boomers together, and uh, if you had 100 depressed people from the last generation, that means you've got 1,000 depressed people from this one. And why is that? I mean, think of those people. I think of my mom and dad. They lived through the war, folks, World War II. I mean, didn't they have some right to be depressed? Their, their, their mom and dad lived through the First World War, the Great Depression, a time where there were no, uh, there were no vaccinations. And, I mean, my, my aunt was deaf because of polio. That's the time they lived in, where there was no antibiotics and people were dying young because they had infections. They lived at those times and were 10 times more depressed than they were. Why? How in the world did we invent such a wonderful culture? And here's what uh, Martin uh, Slingman says. According to his analysis, it's because boomers were the first generation to focus on their own pleasure as the goal of life. Well, we just want to be happy and then we'll be fulfilled. And all it's got us is depressed and miserable. You don't find depression. You don't find the rates of suicide in places like Haiti. Now, Sarah, I was thinking, these people have nothing and they're happy. What's wrong with them? And they look at us and they go, you guys have everything and you're depressed. What's wrong with you? And you know what the difference is? That's the difference. While we pursue happiness to fulfill our needs, they're living life every day doing what they have to do to survive. That's the difference. That's the difference. We have got ourselves so wrapped up in the wrong things, and our character has suffered. Happiness is superficial. Blessedness is deep. Happiness is cheap. Blessedness is rich. Happiness is empty. Blessedness is a life that is full, that is full. One author wrote this, the difference between happiness and blessedness comes, becomes very clear in times of trouble. Happiness and brokenness don't go hand in hand. You can't be both. You can't be happy and broken. But blessedness and brokenness live together. God offers us help whenever we are in trouble. Blessedness is what takes place in your life when Jesus is developing a character. When the door of your life is hinged to the character of Jesus Christ, it swings freely no matter what you are going through. Jesus is developing his kingdom in you, and by transforming your character into his license, you are blessed, and the blessings of God swings on the hinges of your life because you belong to Jesus' kingdom. That's the nature of the blessing. Now let's take a look at the nature of this blessedness that Jesus gives us. Let's, let's look at them for a minute, shall we? Poor in spirit, mourning, meekness, hungering, thirsting, merciful, pure, peacemakers, persecuted. Do those sound like the things that people pursue in our culture? Do those sound like things that people are told to pursue in church? 
Look at I, I, I could preach to you that God wants you to be happy and God wants you to be rich. And maybe I would fill this church if I preached that stuff. The only thing is, it would be a lie. And, and you might even get to be rich and you might even get to, 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 be, uh, to, to, to enjoy this temporary happiness, but inside you'd be miserable and your families could all be falling apart because you don't have the character to even support that kind of a lifestyle. And I would be telling you a lie and you would be pursuing that all of your life and you would be missing out on the kingdom of God. And that's unfortunately that's, that's what, ha what is happening today. Instead, Jesus gives us this picture that people don't pursue because it suggests that there's a powerlessness. Power, powerlessness. It suggests emptiness. John Stott writes this, that the Beatitudes describe what human life and human community look like when they come under the gracious rule of God, when they're in Jesus' kingdom. These blessings are really found, rarely found modeled today in most Christian circles. Why does Jesus choose these virtues, this character, that can only be described as powerlessness and emptiness, as the hinges for the door of the character that you and I are to grow, th grow in and the blessedness of his kingdom? As we look at these things, we find that this is the way that Jesus is pointing for you and I to find fulfillment in our life and to be men and women that, that swing in a way of which our lives will be, uh, the blessings of God will be released in us. Luke chapter 4, verse 33, Jesus says this, in the same way, those of you who do not give up everything, you cannot be my disciples. That's hard, isn't it? That's hard. Those are hard words. We have to give up our pride. We have to give up our self-sufficiency. We have to give up our, our ego and our ambition and all that kind of stuff. In another verse in Luke chapter 9, verse 23, he says this, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves, take up their cross daily, and follow me. Those are hard words. Because after he said them, everybody left them. And then he turned to his disciples, and he says, do you guys want to leave too? And, and, and Peter said, no, because you have the words of life. P Peter, every now and then, Peter had a good... Had a, <laughs> hit the nail on the head, didn't he? Then he'd stick his foot in his mouth, but he'd hit the nail on the head. You have the words of life, and, and, and you're going to give us the kingdom, and you're going to build a character in us in which our lives can swing, and the blessings of God will be upon us because we're living for you. Can you see why Jesus' message was not welcomed by people who had an illusion of power, who wanted nicely decorated doors, even though those doors would have broken hinges? People in, in their day, the Pharisees and the, the Sadducees, the rulers and the lawyers and the political powerful and the people who wanted to have some position and security in this world. Can, can you see why they rejected Jesus and wanted to get him out of their way, why he bothered them? In order to be like Jesus, we have to be like a seed that falls into the ground and dies. That's what Jesus said. Jesus said it another way in, in John chapter 3, uh, in John chapter 25, verse 23, he says this, he says, uh, you must be, sorry, John chapter 3, he says, you must be born again. It's not good enough to put just a coat of paint on the old life, to, to, to nail on some, some flashy thing and say, there, you know what, look at that, look at my door, see how beautiful it is. Jesus says, no, you, you have to go right to the hinges, and you need to have a new life that swings on a, a character that's born in you again, a life dependent on the Holy Spirit's power in life. And that's where it comes from. And so becoming like Jesus and growing a godly character begins with repentance, where we've kind of relied on our own, our own power and our own doors and our own goodness, where we realize, man, it, it's the hinges that count. And then dependence on God's power to fill us, because we can't do it. N.T. Wright wrote this, he said, those who follow Jesus can begin to practice in the present the habits of the heart and life which correspond to the way of things in the kingdom of God. And we begin, we get, begin the service with this, with this verse from Matthew chapter 6. We should all memorize it because it's so important, so say it with me. But seek 
ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness <laughs> and all these things will be added unto you. What comes first? The kingdom of God and his righteousness. What comes first? The character of the kingdom of God on which our lives swing. And what are the blessings that come after? What are the blessings that come after? All these things. All these things will be added unto you. Well, let's look lastly as we close, as I close the service. The purpose of Jesus' kingdom in you is, is the hinges, the hinges grow our character to be transformed into the person that pleases and glorifies God. That's what character is about. We're, that's what we're going to be studying. As children of Jesus' kingdom, our character is hinged on the fact that we possess heaven. We have God's comfort when we are under trial and suffering. We inherit a new heaven and new earth as kings and priests in the service of Jesus our Lord. We are filled to overflowing with abundance and goodness. We receive mercy and forgiveness because we have shown mercy and forgiveness to others. We see God as we would see a friend. We are called God's children because we bring peace wherever we go. And we bless others even when they persecute us and curse us because we are not of the kingdoms of this world, but citizens of the kingdom of heaven. And we are blessed. We're blessed. Turn to the person next to you and just smile at them and say, oh, you can't even see the smile under, a, under one of those masks. So just lift your mask a little bit so they can see your smile and say, I'm blessed because I'm a kid's king. I'm a citizen of the kingdom of heaven. We're blessed. We're truly blessed. We're not just receivers of God's forgiveness. We're receivers of a new life, a life that is blessed and hinged on the character of Christ, a life where we rule as kingdoms, as a kingdom of priests in his kingdom. So as we close this service, let's all stand together. And for those of you at home, just take a moment, close your eyes, because we're going to pray. And we're going to ask the Holy Spirit. We're going to ask the Holy Spirit what kind of a hinge is our life swinging on today? What kind of a hinge? And, and for those here in our congregation this morning in person, just close your eyes and lift your hands. Say, Holy Spirit, speak to me. Show me what kind of a hinge does my life swing on today? Is it a hinge that is, is worldly, that's full of my own ambition? Is it a, is it a hinge that is soft and, and that is, is dependent on Jesus and Jesus' power and Jesus' character? Is it a, is it a hinge that is, is seeking after shiny things to, to make us happy? Or is it a hinge that is seeking the deeper character change and transformation of God? What is, what is the hinge that your life is, is swinging on? And folks, let's just all take a moment and be really honest in church and say, we all, always haven't swung very well. We, we've, sometimes our lives have become a little rusted up because we've been following the wrong thing. We've been hinged, we've, we've been hinged to the wrong thing. That, that there's times where, where our door and we don't experience the blessings of God because we're, we're, so, we're so busy trying to get what we want. When we don't get it, we get upset. And when we get upset, we get down. And when we get down, we get in this funk and we can't get out of it until we look for some other shiny thing to pursue. And let's take a moment today as we realize that those, those bad things exist in our life to ask, Jesus, please forgive me. Let's, let's take a moment to, to, to repent and say, Lord, I repent. Forgive me, O oh God, in Jesus' name. Forgive me, Lord. And now let's take a moment, and I'm going to ask you another question. Now, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, speak to our hearts. What is the one area of character that you think Jesus wants to work on in your life? If you're at home, ask the Holy Spirit that. Holy Spirit, what is the one area of character you want to work in my life? What is the one, one area that you want, to, you, you want to, to take in and you want to hinge my life to? That one area of character. It could be love. It could be joy. It could be peace. 
It could be faithfulness. It could be patience. It could be goodness. It could be kindness. It could be self-control. What is that one area? Now I want you to realize that it's not by might or by power, but by the Spirit. God's Spirit is what transforms you from glory unto glory. And so ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, I need you. I'm dependent on you to change me. Transform me, Lord. Transform me into the man and the woman you want me to be. Transform me and make this character a part of my character. In Jesus' name. Now what I want you to do, if you're at home or if you're here in the church, when you get home, I want you to write it down. Write it down, put it in your Bible, write it down, put it somewhere where you'll be reminded of it. Uh, Over the next eight weeks, I I want God to change this character. And we're going to teach you how God is going to do that in your life and how to partner with God in that change because it just just doesn't fall out of the sky. Say, Lord, I'm dependent on you to change me. And then write it out. Write it out. You got to write it out. It doesn't, ain't going to work if you don't write it out. You got to write it out. Father, thank you that you change us and our lives swing on the character of Jesus that opens the door to blessedness. And I pray that as each person goes, Lord, they would sense and feel that the blessings of God rest upon them for this week, Lord. In Jesus' name, everybody said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful weekend. Good to see you today.